It's my pleasure to introduce Theodore Vo, who'll be speaking from Summary, which is set on the traditional land of the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation. So we pay respect to the elders past, present, and emerging. And Theodore will tell us about canals, cardiac cycles, and chimeras. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so I'd, I'd just like to thank the SNRI for sponsoring my visit. Um, it's been a very productive visit and it's been downright fun to have been able to work with Martin Wechselberger again and also with uh, Ian Vizaraga and Robin, Robbie Maringel. Uh, so our discussions have been about canard theory. We have been reflecting on how far the theory has come, how many branches of the life sciences its applications have touched. And we've also been reflecting on what we think are some of the most interesting challenges to tackle as we move forward. But before I sort of get into any of that, maybe I should just spend a quick moment giving the broad strokes on what canard theory is all about. So in case you're not familiar with it, the canard phenomenon refers to these robust and ubiquitous solutions of singularly perturbed differential equations, which have found enormous practical utility in the life sciences. And one of the reasons I love canard theory is that it's a geometric theory, which means I can show you some really cool pictures. And so just in terms of pictures for now, canards are these curves that lie at the intersections of these red and blue surfaces, like these ones that I'm tracing out here. And so these canards, as it turns out, provide really useful information on how the dynamics are organized in phase space. And under parameter variations, the bifurcations of canards or the manner in which new canards or new intersections of these surfaces are created and destroyed can provide a lot of geometric insight into how and why bifurcations in the model system can occur. And so just to really reinforce my point about how useful canard theory is, um, I just want to spend a few moments showing you in a very non-technical way some of the ways in which canard theory has been used to understand biophysical phenomena. So I'll do three examples from neuroscience. So the first example of canards uh, is that they have been used to explain the origin and properties of these bursting oscillations in cells from the pituitary gland. And the small oscillations in these bursting rhythms are important because they extend the time spent on this elevated voltage plateau or this depolarized voltage phase. And that affects things like hormone and neurotransmitter secretion from the pituitary gland. And so the way that canard theory helps us in this case is that it tells us exactly how many small oscillations to expect in our model during the depolarized phase of the burst. Or in other words, it tells us about the duration of this depolarized phase. It tells us why these small oscillations are even there in the first place. And it tells us how the bursts respond to stimuli or changes in the environment induced by, say, the application of drugs. And so one thing that we were able to actually do with canard theory in this case was we were able to test our predictions experimentally. So there was this experimental observation from 2011, which found that um, fast activating large conductance potassium current tends to promote bursting, but there wasn't a very satisfying explanation as to why. And so what we did in 2014 was we used canard theory to give a geometric explanation of why these fast activating large conductance potassium currents tend to promote bursting in these pituitary cells. Even better, we combined our mathematical analysis with electrophysiological techniques, and we tested our predictions on real GH4 cells in rat brain slices using this experimental technique called dynamic clamp. And we were really lucky because our experimental data agreed with our canard theory. And so we had this very nice geometric explanation by way of canards supported by this data, which we obtained in vitro. So second example of canards in practice comes from a model of uh, paradoxical excitation in propofol anesthesia. So this is a model for this phenomenon where if you give a patient either low or high doses of propofol, they remain sedated, which is exactly what you would want during say surgery. But if you give them propofol doses within a certain range, you get this transient spike, which would amount to the patient like kicking out their leg or something. And so what John Mitri, Michelle McCarthy, Nancy Coppell, and Martin discovered was that it was a canard that formed the boundary between sedation and this so-called post-inhibitory rebound spike. So if you are on one side of the canard, you get transient firing, if you are on the other side of the canard, you remain sedated. So in other words, this canard 
plays the role of the firing threshold. And so to make sure that the patient remains sedated, you have to keep track of that canard and make sure that the propofol doses you apply keep you on the correct side of it. All right, and then the third example of canards in practice comes from a model of the electrical activity in a cerebellar Purkinje cell. A Purkinje cell, by the way, is a large neuron in the cerebellum, which uses its spiking and bursting activity to regulate and coordinate things like motor movement, learning, and cognitive function. So in this cerebellar Purkinje cell model, Mark Kramer, Roger Traub, and Nancy Coppell found that canards mediate the transitions between tonic spiking behavior and bursting behavior. And so with these examples, I hope I've sort of made my point that the canard phenomenon is ubiquitous, especially in models from neuroscience. And very often they are the key to understanding the interesting features of rhythms within those models. And so the plan for the remainder of this seminar is to focus in on the two aspects that I've been thinking about a lot during my time here at the SMRI, namely the applications of canard theory and the new phenomena that can arise from these canards. So we'll start with a specific application. So this is a project with uh, Josh Kimry, who is now at the Applied Physics Lab at Johns Hopkins University, and also with Richard Bertram, who is at Florida State University. And I wanna be clear right off the bat, all of the work I'm presenting here for this particular application was done by Josh during his time as a PhD student with Richard and myself. Okay, so the high level problem is that your heart pumps blood through your body because of a wave of muscle contractions. And those muscle contractions are due to electrical rhythms in your heart muscle cells. And when those rhythms at the cell level are abnormal or diseased, that can cascade into problems at the tissue level. So just for some background, heart muscle cells are excitable and they receive periodic stimulation from the sinoatrial node or from neighboring cells. And the responses to the stimulation of these action potentials, which when coupled to other cells, allows for a wave of electrical activity to propagate through the heart, resulting in the muscle contractions that we all know and love. And two nice features of these action potentials are that they have really clean experimental recordings, which for whatever reason appeals to me on a very personal level. Um, but there's also this one-to-one -one correspondence between the action potentials at the cell level and the tissue scale recordings that you get from non-invasive methods like ECGs or electrocardiograms. Now, the electrophysiology of the cardiac action potential is pretty well understood. The upstroke here is mostly due to sodium influx into the cell. This long plateau is caused by a rough balance of potassium ions leaving the cell and calcium ions entering the cell. And then the downstroke here is mostly due to potassium ions leaving on mass. So our focus is on this class of diseased rhythms called early after depolarizations or EADs. So these are voltage oscillations that occur on the voltage plateau. So you can see EADs in these recordings here indicated by these red arrows. And these EADs may not seem like much to worry about at the individual cell level, but if you couple them together, the problem can spread. In fact, there is strong experimental evidence that EADs at the cell level can cause various cardiac arrhythmias like fibrillation and tachycardia, the symptoms of which include things like chest pain, fainting, dizziness, shortness of breath, nausea, and even cardiac arrest. So EADs are a problem and cardiologists have found lots of ways to induce them in healthy cardiac cells. So James Weiss's group, for instance, achieved it by tuning the stimulus frequency of the uh, forcing or by putting the cells under oxidative stress or by inducing hyperkalemia, which means reducing the potassium level in the blood and that uh, can mess with the cell function. So the mechanism that I want to focus on is related to the calcium channels. The L-type calcium channels have these activation and inactivation curves. The activation curve tells you the fraction of gates that are activated for a given voltage. The inactivation curve tells you the fraction of gates that are inactivated for a given voltage. And then the window region is the voltage range where the activation and inactivation curves overlap. So you can see the window region shaded in blue here. You can also see it shaded in gray up here. And two things that cardiologists seem to universally agree on 
are that EADs occur in the window region, just like this EAD here occurs in the shaded window region, and that an abnormally large window is a mechanism for EADs. So to study the importance of this window region, the Weiss lab and the Workman lab used an experimental technique called dynamic clamp to show three things. So first, symmetric opening of the window by translating the activation and inactivation curves reliably produces EADs. So these recordings here come from a rabbit atrial cell. The numbered arrows indicate the window shift. So the eight label here, for instance, means that the activation and inactivation curves have each been shifted four millivolts. And the response of the cell in that case is to produce EADs. And so the overall trend here is that the larger the window opening, the more EADs and maybe even repolarization failure. Okay, second result. Turns out translating only the activation curve is more effective for producing EADs than translating only the inactivation curve. So in this series of experiments, uh, Madhavani and co-authors systematically shifted the activation curves to widen the window region to see how the cells would respond. And those experiments are summarized here in the bar graphs on the left. And they also systematically shifted the inactivation curve to widen the window region and see how the cells would respond. And that, again, is summarized by these bar graphs over here on the right. And so the punchline for this series of experiments is that translations in the activation curve are much more effective at producing EADs than translations in the inactivation curve. Here, it only takes a five millivolt shift of the activation curve to induce EADs in about 90% of the rhythms, where it, whereas it takes about a 17 millivolt shift of the inactivation curve to get a similar response. Okay, and then the third experimental result is that narrowing the window region can eliminate EADs produced through hyperkalemia. So you can see this over here on the left. So hyperkalemia induces this unhealthy blue rhythm, which has EADs on it, and then shifting the blue activation curve rightward to narrow the window region eliminates the EADs, and it gives us back this healthy black action potential. And again, the bar graphs summarize these experiments. So here, an activation shift by five millivolts essentially wipes out the EADs, whereas an inactivation shift by the same amount reduces the occurrence of EADs from about 85% of the time to about 10% of the time. And so these dynamic camp experiments, yep, is there a question? Sorry, Theo, can I just ask a clarifying question? Yep. So the, the activation inactivation shifts, they were implemented through the dynamic clamp, I through dynamic of course, there's, there's no drug which can do that. I mean, yes, at least exactly. not a reliable drug. Yep, this so is, this a, is the power of using the computer together with a living cell that you can actually do that kind of experiment. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So the, these dynamic clamp experiments, uh, they essentially describe how the window region affects the EADs, but they don't really provide a dynamical explanation as to why. And so we had these three questions that we wanted to answer. Um, so first of all, why does a symmetric opening of the window region promote EADs? Why are translations of the activation curve more effective for EAD generation than translations of the inactivation curve? And why does narrowing the window region eliminate EADs produced through hyperkalemia? And so the framework that we will use to answer those questions is based on a seminal model for cardiac muscle cells called the Lua Rudy model. And conceptually speaking, the cell is modeled as an electric circuit using the same kind of formalism as Hodgkin Huxley. The equations themselves are these coupled nonlinear ODEs. The terms that we're interested in and the ones that the dynamic clamp experiments were tinkering with are the stimulus current, which is needed to evoke any kind of activity in the excitable cell, and the calcium current. And the calcium current is the one that has this blue activation curve represented here by this d infinity term and it has the red inactivation curve represented in these equations by this red f infinity term and so what the experiments were doing was they were shifting these red and blue curves left and right to widen or narrow this shaded window region now before i get into any of the analysis we should maybe talk about why we think this is a good model and the short answer is that 
This model reproduces all of the observed experimental behaviors. So for instance, symmetric opening of the window region takes us from the healthy green action potential to a slightly prolonged orange action potential to an unhealthy action potential that has two EADs. And finally, to repolarization failure here in black. And so to quantify the effectiveness of these window shifts, we ran a grid of simulations. And by we, I mean Josh ran a grid of simulations to produce this two parameter diagram. So shifts in the activation curve are here on the horizontal axis and shifts in the inactivation curve are on the vertical axis. This diagonal blue line is the locus of symmetric window opening. And this green region consists of regular healthy action potentials. In this blank region, the cell fails to repolarize after a stimulus. And in between, in this red region, uh, the action potentials have EADs. And this red region is organized into bands, with each band indicating a distinct number of EADs. And so essentially what I'm saying here is that everything above this green boundary is unhealthy. Um, Question? So, so is what's happening, yeah, is what's happening that, you know, I mean, if, if you have, you know, EADs and you basically have an excitable medium. And if you look at sort of the null clients of those two, you know, activate inhibitors, is all that's happening is kind of that, that inhibitor null client just bends down, then, you know, you have kind of a hop and in the end you have, um, you just have a bistable system and that would be the repolarization failure. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's exactly something like that scenario. Yeah, okay. so there's okay. a equilibrium that sits up on the, uh, the depolarized phase and then the stimulus pushes you into the basin of attraction of that other equilibrium. Right, thanks, thanks. Yeah. Sort of a geometric picture we have in mind. Yeah, okay. And so all of this discussion here is to say that the model is reliable insofar as it reproduces the experimental behavior that we want to study. And so now we ask the question of why does broadening the window region lead to EADs and repolarization failure? And to answer that question, we are going to use techniques from geometric singular perturbation theory. And so here is the punchline up front. The EADs are canard induced oscillations. And I'll explain what I mean. So, if we go back to the model equations, it can be shown that there is this slow fast structure. And for these sorts of singular perturbation problems, the idea is to decompose the dynamics into fast and slow subsystems, analyze those lower dimensional subsystems, and then stitch the information together to gain insight into the dynamics. So in our, in our case, the fast subsystem equilibria or the critical manifold forms these red and blue surfaces so blue here is stable, red here is unstable. And then the green fold curve is where the stability changes. And then there is this point E1 down here, which is the equilibrium that corresponds to the resting potential. And so in terms of this geometry, the action potential with EADs can be broken down as follows. The stimulus pulse applied to the rest state E1 triggers a rapid excursion towards the upper blue sheet of that critical manifold. The solution then drifts along the blue sheet towards the green fold curve. And then the oscillations that occur near the fold curve are the EADs themselves. And once the EADs have occurred, the trajectory jumps down to the lower blue repolarization surface and it slowly wanders back to the resting potential at E1. And so this rhythm matches the geometry pretty well everywhere except in this EAD region. And to explain the EADs, we are looking for any candidate mechanisms from the fast or slow subsystems that may induce local oscillatory behavior. So as it turns out in this model, there is no hop bifurcation in the fast subsystem. There are no fast subsystem limit cycles as far as we could determine. And so the only object that could be responsible is this thing called a folded node singularity, which I have marked in purple here. So let me show you what I mean by that. These red and blue surfaces are the singular limit structures. But if you move away from the singular limit, these manifolds deform and the folded node causes some funkiness. And by funkiness, I mean the blue part of the critical manifold becomes this twisted attracting slow manifold and the red part becomes this twisted saddle slow manifold. 
And I should probably give a shout out here to uh, Chris Hassan, Bernd Krauskopf and Hinka Ossinger. Um, our computational methods here, especially for the saddle slow manifold, were based on the ones that they developed for saddle slow manifolds and canard orbits in R4. Okay, so in these figures, the intersections of the blue and red manifolds, so gamma naught, gamma one, gamma two, these are what we call maximal canards. So anything to the left of the strong canard, gamma naught, will repolarize in a healthy way, which you can see in this cyan trajectory here. Anything between gamma naught and gamma one has exactly one EAD. And you can see that in this beige orbit. And then anything between gamma one and gamma two has exactly two EADs. So that's this orange curve. And so these maximal canards are phase space separatrices that create rotational sectors with each sector having a distinct number of EADs. And so anytime we see an EAD in our model, it's because the stimulus is injecting the orbit into a rotational sector between a pair of maximal canards. And so this is what we mean when we say that the EADs are canard induced. There is this underlying twisted slow manifold and canard structure, and any solution on the attracting slow manifold to the left of the strong canard gamma naught will repolarize in a healthy way. Anything to the right of it will be unhealthy and have EADs. And so by knowing where these canards are relative to the trajectories, we can now explain all of the arrhythmias that we've seen. So we will start by recasting these window shifts in terms of the canards. So the green boundary between the no EAD region and the EAD region is the parameter set for which the stimulus injects orbits directly onto the strong canard, which again is that phase space boundary between healthy action potentials and EADs. The boundaries between each of the red bands in the EAD region across those other canards, so gamma one, gamma two, and so on in succession. And then this black boundary between EADs and repolarization failure occurs when the orbit gets pushed far enough that it lands in the basin of attraction of another equilibrium, which is a focus in this case, E2. And so with this view of the dynamics, we can go back and answer those questions that we had about the dynamic clamp experiments. So first up, why does a symmetric opening of the window region promote EADs? Because window openings push the black orbit past the canards into the EAD regions. And with sufficiently large openings, the orbit gets pushed into the basin of attraction of that other equilibrium E2, and hence we get repolarization failure. The next question, why are translations of the activation curve more effective for EAD generation than translations of the inactivation curve? Well, it's because the canards themselves are more sensitive to shifts in the activation curve than they are to shifts in the inactivation curve. So you can see that here, shifting the activation curve by 3.6 millivolts moves the black orbit past the canard, whereas shifting the inactivation curve by the same amount keeps the black orbit left of the canard. And over here on the right is a more quantitative view of that statement. You need to shift the activation curve by about three and a half millivolts to have the orbit cross the strong canard and produce EADs. Whereas for the inactivation curve, it takes about a four and a half millivolt shift to achieve the same effect. And then the other question is why does narrowing the window region eliminate EADs produced through hyperkalemia? And again, the answer is because of canards. Inducing hyperkalemia moves us from the healthy green action potential to the unhealthy red one with two EADs by crossing the canards and moving into the rotational sectors. And then by narrowing the window region, that moves us, uh, or that moves the orbit left of the canards outside the rotational sectors, and that restores the healthy orange action potential. So the model reproduces the dynamic clamp experiments, and we have shown that the dynamics can be explained by these canards. And so the next thing to do is to make our own set of predictions. So let's say that we have a cell which is in a hyperkalemic environment and that it is generating EADs. So our starting point would be this blue diamond here sitting in the middle of the red EAD band. And one thing that dynamic clamp experiments can do, which Martin alluded to, is they can mess around with the activation and inactivation rates of the calcium current. 
So instead of changing the D infinity and the F infinity functions, we are now changing the rate functions, tau D and tau F. So to recover from EADs, we want to move to where the grass is greener. So geometrically speaking, we know that the way to do that is by keeping ourselves to the left of any and all canards. Now, in terms of electrophysiology, our superambular diagram tells us that the way to do this is to either speed up the calcium activation or to slow down the calcium inactivation or via some combination of both. So that's our experimental prediction. Recovery from EADs can be achieved by speeding up calcium activation or slowing down calcium inactivation or via some combination. And if it turns out that the experiments validate these predictions, then maybe future ther therapeutic strategies for EAD elimination could be targeted in this direction. Um, so I should say testing these predictions experimentally is feasible. Uh, actually convincing someone to do it seems less feasible. Okay, so let me just summarize the important points of this particular application. Dynamic clamp experiments have shown that the calcium window region is really important in regulating the electrical rhythms of cardiac cells. There is a laundry list of experimental observations and the main theme of this work that Josh did was that all of these behaviors can be reproduced and explained in terms of canard dynamics. And recasting these experimental results in terms of canards is useful because it gives us predictive power. Knowing about and tracking canards allows us to predict which changes in biophysical parameters will elicit EADs or repolarization block. And more importantly, it tells us how to recover from these disease states. So I think that's a good place to leave the applications of canard side of things. Um, I'm going to switch gears now and think about some of the new canard driven phenomena that are still being discovered. And by the way, if you happen to tune out in the previous part, this would be a natural place to jump back on board. I'd like to uh, ask a question. If you go back two slides to um, this one, yeah, I mean, you sort of showed us, yeah, either of those is good. I mean, you have sort of these graphs, right, where the you see this region between the no EADs and the repolarization sort of becoming narrower and narrower. Yes. And so, can you actually sort of, if you were to extend this further in your model, I mean, do you sort of have points where you go straight from repolarization to no EADs without this intermediate region? Yeah, that's a great question. So there is this um, strange region. Uh, uh, so in some cases, depending on the other system parameters, it might be the case that these curves actually bend back and the region opens up again. Um, so yeah. it never actually quite pinches off. Uh, there are mm -hmm. other regions where the dynamics do something incredibly funky and we consider that to be a model degeneracy. So we're not sure if it, we, the reason why we uh, consider it to be a model degeneracy is because we haven't actually seen any experimental data that matches those kinds of rhythms. So it might just be a kink of the, the model. Does that sort of answer the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I had just wondered when, right? Because you have all these canals sort of being wedged in more and more, whether maybe there's something interesting about the intersection of these submanifolds or whether they have a singularity there. Yeah. Yeah. So it seems like a very natural thing to um, speed up the, oh, sorry, to slow down the uh, calcium activation and have this region pinch off entirely. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems to be that the time series that you get out of those. Uh, parameter regions don't really match anything in experiments. So we've been sort of avoiding those regions. Okay, so I'm um, going to talk about some of the new canard driven phenomena. And this is a project that I have spent the better part of the last year and a half or so thinking about with uh, Tasso Kappa from Boston University. So as the title here suggests, um, we have been thinking about chimera states in coupled oscillator systems. So chimeras were discovered in about 2002 by Kuramoto, and they were given their name by Steve Strogatz in 2004. Um, they were found in models of densely and uniformly distributed identical oscillators subject to finite range non-local coupling. So this example here comes from a system of Stuart Landau oscillators with non-local coupling. And this is called a chimera because the whole spatio-temporal pattern that you see here is made up of the parts of more than one type of animal, so to speak. There is a population of mutually synchronized oscillators in the bottom half of the space-time plot. So these oscillators are coherent and they are phase-locked, as you can see in the phase plot down the bottom. And coexisting with the synchronized population is a population of desynchronized oscillators with distributed frequencies. So these oscillators are decoherent and their phases drift relative to each other 
and relative to the phase locked oscillators, which you can see from the random distribution of phases down here. And initially, these chimeras seemed a bit fantastical. The belief was that it was impossible for chimeras to exist in locally or globally coupled systems. But in the 20 or so years since their discovery, chimeras have been found in systems with global coupling, such as these stripe and spot chimeras here. They have been found in systems with local coupling, and they have also been found in systems in which the coupling of the identical oscillators occurs via delay or noise. And so what I'm saying is that the scope of their applicability has really grown. And even better, chimeras have been found experimentally in chemical oscillator systems, for instance. And so this is all to say that chimeras are more than just a mathematical curiosity. And so about two years ago, uh, Tasso and I were working with Richard Bertram on multimode attractors and reaction diffusion PDEs. So these multimode attractors are a class of attractors of reaction diffusion systems in which different parts of the spatial domain exhibit different modes of oscillation. So this representative here comes from a spatially extended model of the electrical activity in a pituitary lactate trough. So the attractor consists of three modes, each occurring in a different region of the spatial domain. So along the bottom part of the domain, the attractor exhibits these relaxation oscillations. Along the top part of the domain, the attractor exhibits these mixed mode oscillations in which each full cycle consists of small amplitude oscillations sitting on top of large amplitude relaxation oscillations. And in the middle region, well, the attractor alternates between relaxation and mixed mode oscillations. And so the yeah. So just the question of, because like, there are all these different um, definitions of, of chimeras or what people think is a chimera. So where those uh, three different modes are in space, is that dependent on the initial condition? So is it really like a symmetry breaking or is there some kind of heterogeneity that you impose? There's, in this particular model, there is a heterogeneity that comes in via a forcing term. So it's a space dependent forcing term oh, okay. being applied to the equation for this particular case. Um, I will actually come back to the uh, address that question in the next model that we're going to look at. Okay, thanks. Yep. Yep. So the uh, the crucial feature that I want to point out here about these multimode attractors and what makes them possible are these spatiotemporal analogs of canards, and those spatiotemporal canards mediate the transitions between these three different regions of activity. And so when we published this article, one of the referees for our manuscript pointed out that these multimode attractors may have connections to the chimera literature. And at the time, we determined that the multimode attractors did have some features in common with chimera states. So for instance, they have distinct modes of coherent phase locked oscillations coexisting on different regions. And there is by stability of the multimode attractor with a homogeneous attractor, just as there is often by stability of an asynchronous chimera state with a spatially symmetric synchronous state. However, each of the regions in these multimode attractors contains distinct modes of synchronous oscillation. There is no complementary region of decoherence. And so at the time we ruled this out, we determined that these multimode attractors are not chimeras. But the question from the referee kind of stuck and it got us thinking, maybe there is a way to get a chimera using these spatiotemporal canards. And it was Tasso who really brought the question into focus. He asked if it was possible to have part of the spatial domain exhibiting these kinds of mixed mode oscillations and another part of the domain exhibiting purely small amplitude oscillations. And once Tasso formulated the question like that, that's when it occurred to me that the canard dynamics near a folded saddle node might have the ingredients that we need. And so that's what eventually led us to our discovery of this new class of chimera states, which we are calling mixed amplitude chimeras. So these mixed amplitude chimeras exhibit regions of decoherent small amplitude oscillations and complementary regions of coherent large amplitude mixed mode oscillations. So for this representative mixed amplitude chimera, the regions of decoherent small amplitude oscillations occur along the top and bottom parts of the domain. And this central band with the red boomerangs is where the coherent cluster of mixed mode oscillations occurs. And you can see from the time series over here on the right that the contrast in the amplitudes and the frequencies is substantial. The amplitudes in the coherent and decoherent regions differ by more than one order of magnitude, and they are also structurally different. I mean, in the decoherent regions, we've got small oscillations with amplitudes on the order of square root epsilon, 
and they can look like your standard amplitude modulated waveform, or they can look a little more irregular. In the coherent regions, the mixed mode oscillations have slow fast dynamics and their amplitudes are up to order one magnitude. And so this disparity in the amplitudes is in stark contrast to the chimeras that are usually seen and studied in systems of coupled oscillators. And that's a good thing. The mixed amplitude chimeras can potentially expand the scope of chimeras and applications, maybe potentially to something like sleep-wake dynamics. So as an example, these are EEG recordings taken from the brain of a bottlenose dolphin in which the left hemisphere is asleep and the right hemisphere is awake to keep the dolphin alert to and on the move from predators. And you can see why I'm speculating that the mixed amplitude chimeras would be natural for this. The recordings from the sleeping hemisphere are high amplitude, low frequency, whereas the recordings from the awake hemisphere are low amplitude, high frequency. Now, the mixed amplitude chimeras come in all sorts of flavors. Uh, the coherent clusters of mixed mode oscillations can occur periodically in time at fixed locations in space, like in these two examples over here on the left, but they can also occur at random locations and at random times like these examples over here on the right. And so to give you a better sense of where you would expect to see these mixed amplitude chimeras, let me just spend a few moments on the PDE that generated them. So we were studying the force van der Poel PDE with zero flux boundary conditions. U is the activator, V is the inhibitor, epsilon is a small parameter and it measures the time scale of separation between the fast activator and the slow inhibitor. This parameter A is a threshold parameter for excitability, B is the forcing amplitude, omega is the forcing frequency, and then du and dv are the diffusivities. And the reason that we chose force van der Poel is that it sort of represents the minimal PDE with all of the features that we need to generate the mixed amplitude chimeras. So first, the PDE is purely local. All of the parameters are spatially homogeneous, which means the kinetics are identical at all points in space and the diffusion only acts on the nearest neighbors. The second feature is that the PDE is bistable, which means that in a slow fast decomposition, the critical manifold is cubic shaped with the outer sheets being attracting and the middle sheet being repelling. And third, the kinetics need to support folded node and folded saddle canals. And so force van der Poel was the simplest system that we could think of that has all of these features, but two other systems we identified that would be good candidates for the mixed amplitude chimeras would be the Fitzhugh Nagumo PDE from neuroscience and the Langyo Epstein model for oscillations and Turing pattern formation in chemical reactions. Now, in terms of this geometry, the small oscillations from the mixed amplitude chimeras are classical phase waves that oscillate about the U equals zero fold curve here. Diffusion is what decoheres the small oscillations, which is pretty typical for chimeras. Um, as for the mixed mode oscillations, those consist of small amplitude oscillations near the U equals zero fold with large amplitude relaxation oscillations that closely follow the cubic with the fast jumps occurring in the neighborhoods of the folds. So again, the mixed amplitude chimeras are this new class of chimera state. The amplitudes and the frequencies in the oscillations in the coherent regions differ significantly from those in the decoherent regions. And so with, all, with this new phenomenon comes all sorts of questions like how robust are the mixed amplitude chimeras? Uh, what kinds of bifurcations do they undergo? What other properties do they have? But the first question that we should really address is how exactly do we identify and classify our chimeras? And this, as it turns out, is a little bit tougher to answer than expected. Turns out the typical coherence measures for chimeras inherently rely on the fact that the oscillators have similar amplitudes. It's kind of baked into the mean field theory approach for chimeras in which amplitude phase decompositions are used to find the chimeras and the states from which they bifurcate. Um, other methods like local order parameters and things like the Hilbert transform run into technical problems when you try to apply them to the mixed amplitude chimeras. And so what actually ended up working for us was this classification scheme developed by uh, Felix Kenneth and co-authors. And the classification essentially has two steps. First, determine whether or not the pattern is a chimera by using the local curvature. And then second, determine the type of chimera based on the correlation coefficients for the time series of the oscillators at different points in space. 
So let me use this representative mixed amplitude chimera as a demonstration. The first measurement is a measure of spatial coherence. And the way that Kenneth and co-authors do it is they take their pattern and they measure the probability that the curvature at any given time is relatively flat. So if the probability is always one, then the profile has little to no spatial variation and the pattern is totally coherent. If the probability is zero, then the pattern is fluctuating wildly and it is totally decoherent. And if the probability varies between zero and one, well, then that means that some parts of the domain are coherent, other parts are decoherent, which means we have a, de uh, we have a chimera. So the spatial coherence measure for our representative is shown here in blue. It has fast jumps corresponding to the fast jumps in the mixed mode oscillations. And between the fast jumps, the measure fluctuates randomly due to the decoherent small oscillations. And since this thing varies between zero and one, that means our representative has a mix of coherent clusters and decoherent regions. Or in other words, our representative really is a chimera state. Next, um, we need a measure of the temporal coherence. And without going into any of the details, the idea is to measure the probability that the time series of each oscillator is linearly correlated to all other oscillators. Now in practice, what this actually does is it quantifies the spatial movement of the coherent clusters over time. So if the probability is one, all of the oscillators are correlated and there is no temporal decoherence. If the probability is non-zero, that means that the coherent cluster is actually fixed in space. And if the probability goes to zero, well then the coherent cluster changes its position over time. So for our representative here, the temporal correlation measure is this red line and its value is non-zero, which indicates that the coherent cluster has a fixed location and that very much agrees with the space-time plot above. And so if we apply the same measures to the more chaotic looking patterns, uh, the blue spatial coherence measure varies between zero and one. So that tells us this is indeed a mixed amplitude chimera. And the red temporal coherence measure here actually goes to zero, which tells us that the coherent clusters change their position over time. And again, that is very much consistent with the actual space-time plot. So all in all, these measures are good enough for our purposes, and they allowed us to do this very extensive sweep of the parameter space to get a sense of how robust the mixed amplitude chimeras are. So this two-parameter plane shows the long-term behavior of the PDE. The activator diffusivity is along the horizontal axis. The inhibitor diffusivity is along the vertical axis. And the various markers here indicate the type of state observed in the long-term behavior of the PDE. So the red and blue circles indicate that a mixed amplitude chimera was observed as an attractor. The red circles correspond to the chimeras that have randomly occurring coherent clusters. And the blue circles correspond to chimeras in which the coherent clusters are fixed in space. And so you can see that the mixed amplitude chimeras actually occupy a pretty sizable chunk of the parameter plane. So I think it's safe to say these mixed amplitude chimeras are robust. Now, in doing this parameter sweep, we found that the mixed amplitude chimeras emerge from other states in novel bifurcations. So over here on the left, of, oh, on the left edge of the chimera region, the mixed amplitude chimeras bifurcate from these sharp interface solutions, which are actually pretty common in bistable PDEs. And uh, this is sharp interface because the spatial profile at each instant in time has sharp jumps connecting different homogeneous states. The novel feature here is that the mixed amplitude chimeras are bifurcating from these sharp interface solutions rather than bifurcating from homogeneous or drift states, which is what you would normally expect to see with chimeras. At the right edge of the chimera region, the chimeras bifurcate from these spatially uniform time periodic mixed mode oscillations. And that's kind of striking. It suggests that diffusion of the activator is trying to spread the large amplitude mixed mode oscillations so when the diffusivity of the activator is large relative to the diffusivity of the inhibitor, the mixed mode oscillations spread all the way across the domain, and that gives us our spatially uniform solutions. And when the diffusivity of the activator is small enough relative to the inhibitor, the decoherent small oscillations can resist the invasion of the mixed mode oscillations. Now, within the chimera region itself, 
there are these wedges in the parameter space. So you can see one of those wedges magnified down here in which the coherent clusters are fixed in space and they are time periodic, like in these examples over here on the right. And these things can undergo additional bifurcations in which say the widths of the coherent clusters vary periodically. And so what I'm saying is that there is this very rich bifurcation structure here. And at this stage, we don't know how or why those bifurcations occur. Now, another feature is that the mixed amplitude chimeras exhibit multi-stability. So for example, we found the representative mixed amplitude chimera actually coexists with three other stable states for the same parameters. So it coexists with this chimera where the coherent clusters occur along the edges of the domain. It also coexists with this chimera, which sort of combines the previous two. The coherent clusters occur along the edges of the domain as well as in the center of the domain. And it also coexists with a totally coherent spatially uniform state of mixed mode oscillations. And so this is what Georg was alluding to with the symmetry breaking and the choice of initial conditions. You can get all of these different types of attractors. Okay, so now that we've seen some of their rich dynamics, um, let's talk about the mechanisms that are at the heart of these mixed amplitude chimeras. And what this all essentially boils down to is the canard dynamics of folded nodes and folded saddles in slow fast systems. Uh, so for this part, let me just revisit the ODE. We know that for slow fast systems, you can use geometric singular perturbation theory to study the underlying geometric structures which organize the dynamics. And for force van der Poel, the critical manifold has these attracting blue sheets and repelling red sheet. And those attracting and repelling sheets are separated by fold curves. And along the fold curves, there are these blue folded node singularities, and there are these red folded saddle singularities. The folded nodes and the folded saddles each have families of canard solutions associated to them. Um, so here I have drawn the strong canard of the folded node in cyan, and I've drawn the true canard of the folded saddle in magenta. And the purpose of doing that is to highlight this shaded funnel region, which is the basin of attraction for the folded node. And so maybe the simplest way to show why these features are important is to show how trajectories evolve relative to these things. So here on the left is a mixed mode oscillation. It starts in the funnel of the folded node. It gets pulled into the neighborhood of the folded node where it then does these small localized rotations. And after a few of these rotations, the repelling manifold kicks the trajectory down to the lower attracting sheet where it slowly drifts to the next fold and then it jumps back up into the funnel ready to repeat the process. And so that's how canard induced mixed mode oscillations of the forced van der Poel ODE work. For the small amplitude oscillations over here on the right, the trajectory visits both the attracting and the repelling sheets. In fact, it spends significant time on the repelling side without being kicked away. You can also see that the trajectory winds around the green axis of rotation here. And this green axis of rotation, roughly speaking, is a heteroclinic that connects the weak canard of the folded node and the faux canard of the folded saddle. And if you're not familiar with canard theory, the point I'm making is that the small oscillations involve the canards of both the folded node and the canards of the folded saddle. Okay, and so with all of this in mind, Let's revisit our representative chimera for the PDE. So here we have a time series of the mixed amplitude chimera taken at the center of the coherent region. So the time series alternates between canard induced mixed mode oscillations with five small oscillations and with three small oscillations. And the number of small oscillations is determined by where the solution gets injected into this gray shaded funnel region. In the decoherent regions, the solution winds around that green heteroclinic, just like we saw in the ODE case, which is to say that the small oscillations in the decoherent regions are also canard induced rhythms. And so what we learn in doing this comparison is that the canard dynamics of folded nodes and folded saddles form the backbone of the mixed amplitude chimeras. And what also became clear to us in doing this comparison is that in order to get mixed amplitude chimeras, we need the distance between the folded nodes and the folded saddles to be in this sweet spot or in this Goldilocks zone, if you will. The distance between the folded node and the folded saddle needs to be large enough that solutions can peel off the repelling manifold and execute those large amplitude 
uh, excursions, which bring them back to the funnel of the next folded node. But at the same time, the distance between the folded node and the folded saddle needs to be small enough that solutions can go all the way across the repelling manifold so that there is no fast jump and the oscillations remain small. Now, as it turns out, these Goldilocks conditions exist on robust regions of parameter space. And for force Thunderpole, the Goldilocks region is this yellow band in the A omega plane um, in the middle of the parameter regime where you would normally expect mixed mode oscillations. And generally speaking, the Goldilocks zone here is related to saddle node bifurcations of the folded singularities. So what I mean is that the upper boundary here between the small amplitude and mixed mode oscillations corresponds to a saddle node bifurcation of the folded node and a folded saddle. And similarly for the other boundary, which separates the mixed mode and large amplitude oscillations. And so this is all to say that when you go looking for your Goldilocks zone in your model, you should look for it somewhere close to a saddle node bifurcation of these folded node singularities. Okay, so having presented the novel mixed amplitude chimeras, um, let me switch gears just a little bit and give some analysis to explain how the decoherent small oscillations can exist. So given that the parameters are tuned so that the folded node and folded saddle pairs are close to each other, there is a rescaling that you can do to zoom in on a neighborhood of those two singularities. And if you take that heteroclinic that connects the folded node and the folded saddle and you straighten it out, and then you switch to complex coordinates, you get this equivalent PDE to leading order. So we have fast variables, Z and its conjugate, Z bar, and we have a slow theta variable. The coefficient mu for the linear terms is a function of the slow theta variable, which uh, I have sketched over here. And so what it shows is that as the slow variable theta increases, mu, or in other words, the real part of the eigenvalue goes from negative to positive and then back to negative. And so then slow fast analysis shows that the critical manifold in this case is the theta axis. It's stable whenever mu is negative. It is unstable whenever mu is positive and it undergoes hop bifurcations whenever mu is zero. And so the effect of these coordinate transformations is they convert the folded nodes and the folded saddles into pairs of hop bifurcations. And so what this slow increase of theta does is it slowly carries solutions of the PDE through these hop bifurcations. So what we have is slow passage through hop bifurcations in a reaction diffusion PDE. And fortunately, there is a theory that has been worked out for this. And what that theory provides are rigorous estimates that show that the nonlinear terms stay small on both the attracting and repelling branches. And what that means is that we can use just the linear and the diffusive terms to estimate the amount of time that solutions can follow the repelling branch. And it turns out those times can be long enough that solutions can make it past that second hop bifurcation and cross from the repelling side and return to the attracting side. And so this phenomenon of delayed hop bifurcation in reaction diffusion equations is the reason why the small oscillations are able to pass through the folded node follow the repelling manifold all the way through the folded saddle and return to the attracting manifold and hence stay small amplitude and decoherent. Okay, so just to bring our focus back to the chimeras themselves, um, I should mention the effect of the forcing amplitude. All of the mixed amplitude chimeras I've presented so far have been for weak forcing. That being said, the local analysis I just showed you still holds for stronger forcing and the mixed amplitude chimeras themselves also persist in the presence of stronger forcing. The main difference is that the regions of the small oscillations actually become coherent. So what I'm saying is that as the forcing amplitude is increased, the mixed amplitude chimeras become multi-mode attractors in which parts of the domain exhibit coherent mixed mode oscillations and other parts of the domain exhibit coherent small oscillations. So this is a nice link back to the work that got us thinking about these chimeras in the first place. All right, so just to wrap things up, um, our main result here is the discovery of mixed amplitude chimeras in biostable PDEs with spatially homogeneous parameters and purely local diffusive coupling. The decoherent small oscillations and the coherent mixed mode oscillations are structurally different with significantly different amplitudes and frequencies. And we found these chimeras on large open subsets of the parameter space and they bifurcate from other states in new and unusual ways. 
And the thing that makes them possible are the canard dynamics of folded nodes and folded saddles, especially when they're in that Goldilocks zone where the folded nodes and the folded saddles are just the right distances from each other. And finally, we showed that the theory of delayed hop bifurcations in reaction diffusion equations is what gives us a rigorous theoretical underpinning for why the small oscillations can follow the repelling manifolds for long times and stay small and decoherent. So I'll end on the following note, which is to say, chimeras have been the subject of intense study since their discovery. Uh, folded nodes, folded saddles, and their canard dynamics have also been established as generic and robust mechanisms for rhythms in numerous applications. And so one of the exciting things about the mixed amplitude chimeras is they combine these ubiquitous phenomena. And given how robustly they occurred in this very generic bistable PDE, we have a lot of hope that we will find use for them in applications like sleep-wake dynamics. And on that promising note, I think I will stop there. Thanks so much for your time and attention. Yeah, thank you very much for a wonderful talk, Theodore. Are there any questions or comments from the audience? Very silly question. Um, so you showed this diagram that if you increase the diffusivity of the inhibitor, um, you actually promote these, uh, um, you know, the, the chimera states. And if I just think kind of, you know, sort of in a stupid way, and I think, okay, if I have, you know, high, high diffusion for the inhibitor and, and small diffusion for the activator, um, then I should expect, or maybe I would expe uh, um, expect some Turing patterns. And so I would actually expect some kind of regular structures rather. So what's, what's wrong with that thinking? Uh, yeah, so I guess one thing that I sort of neglected to mention here is that um, this diagram shows the relative strengths of the diffusivities to each other, but in terms of absolute values, these are like order epsilon cubed. For instance, they're really small diffusivities. Oh, okay. So if you were to ramp up the diffusivity of, of, of the then, inhibitor, would you then you would get, you know, I something think we like go back to the regime that you're thinking of with the, oh, okay. the more okay, thanks. Pattern. Thanks for okay. clear. Okay, yeah. thanks. Actually, whilst we're at this figure, I think you explained to us what the triangles are, but there's also squares. <laughs> I think I missed those. Uh, these are what we call um, phase or trigger wave type patterns. So the mm -hmm. squares correspond to patterns in which you have uh, these mixed mode oscillations occurring as these traveling waves, and they either get reflected off a zero flux boundary condition, or they can meet in the interior of the domain and either annihilate each other, or they can nucleate and create pairs that travel outwards in opposite directions at the same speed. And so when you zoom into the picture, like um, when you sort of zoom into your red and blue region, I guess you see that this sort of becomes, has really sort of interesting structure, yeah? So is this also similar in that other region with the triangles and squares? Um, sorry, could you sort of just repeat that question? Oh, you had, I mean, in one of your slides, you sort of showed what one gets when one zooms into your region uh, with the red and blue, right? That you sort of right. see interesting bifurcation patterns there as well. Right. So see, local structure so similar also in the other region where you have the triangles and squares yes very much so um so there's this other sort of feature of these diagrams is that you know there's multi-stability and it's um at least for me i don't really know how to track when i'm in the basin of attraction of one or the other so it's hard to say um whether it's a bifurcation that you're encountering or if you've just fallen into the basin of attraction of something else um but yes at least for the the trigger wave type patterns, um, they have very interesting uh, bifurcations that occur as you vary the diffusivities. So for instance, um, here we have one, two, three uh, interaction sites in the interior of the domain, but as you vary, say, just the activated diffusivity, um, that can sort of have a saddle node type bifurcation that creates an extra pair of uh, interaction sites in the interior. Can you, can you comment one more time, like on the on the scale separation that is necessary. So uh, I just missed it. Uh, so what's the scale uh, relationship between the temporal and the diffus diffusive you know, scaling in, in your system that guarantees that you can actually find those mixed mode uh, chimeras? Yep, so the, the ballpark that we, uh, we established is that if you have a time scale separation of order epsilon, then the spatial uh, separation needs to be something like order epsilon cubed or uh, epsilon to the five halves. Um, but that is just an empirical observation at this moment. Okay, but so you only need very little diffusion. 
Yeah, so like four is basically essentially like, like this three time scale thing where you know you've got the mm -hmm. yeah um, the time scale separation in the kinetics, and then for the diffusive part, you need to make that super slow relative to, to mm -hmm. the kinetics. And and the drive, of course, in your case, the driving force is on the, the same scale as your inhibitor. Yeah, the driving frequency is order epsilon as well. Mm -hmm. So that's another way of playing around, probably like. With the omega or something, the, yeah, exactly. The, yeah. Exactly. yeah, yeah. Can I make follow up on this uh, diffusion, kind of the strength of the diffusion question? So, like, if I just have an ODE, you know, you get your mixed mode oscillation as you've shown. You know, you kind of oscillate around. Um, and if I have too much diffusion, I would sort of that would couple too much to sort of that that you know they all get kind of different things and then uh, like different oscillations and then they sort of average out in some sense or. Mm -hmm. Is that a way to see it? And so I want just a little diffusion so that each of them can maintain yeah. Uh, yeah. the canard, like their own canard. But, but the, it, is what the diffusion just kind of couple them in the way that they synchronize in some sense? Yeah, so like there's this, um, somehow there's this balance. So if the diffusivity in the activator direction is uh, too high relative to the inhibitor one, um, then what you tend to get are these sort of patterns. Um, yeah. So it's just like this jumble and things just sort of invade and interact with each other in sort of a, know, let's say, chaotic sort of fashion. If the actor, if the diffusivity of the uh, inhibitor is too large relative to the activator, then typically what happens is you get those sharp interface type solutions. So everything sort of becomes horizontally banded. And so in this red blue region, there is just this like perfect balance of those two effects where um, the activator is diffusivity is trying to create this kind of behavior. The inhibitor diffusivity is trying to cause that sort of horizontal banding. And then you get just sort of this perfect uh, balance of the two. Yeah, the presence of the inhibitor diffusivity kind of makes me nervous when it comes to like slow fast splitting, because this is the same issue we have here with the phase trigger wave stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like morally speaking, these parameter plots are kind of two-dimensional projections of what you're seeing, right? Like right. you might expect maybe some function of epsilon for the inhibitory diffusivity. To... Yeah. Yeah, and you notice that like, um, all of these behaviors sort of start to trickle off and really right. disappear as you yeah. Yeah, kill off the inhibitor diffusivity. So you really need diffusion in that other component. Mm -hmm. So classic FITU would not give you anything, FITU Nagomo, where you don't uh, put diffusion on the, on the inhibitor. That's right. You would need to put something in like calcium dynamics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's why nobody saw it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. I see. That's very cool. Do you really think, I mean, just more philosophically speaking, so is there a high chance that you truly see that in biological system? Now we can speak <laughs> honestly. It's just us around here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I mean, like it's an interesting. No, no, I mean it more like really from from that question. I, I really like that uh, that 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 sleeping uh, beauty here. Yeah, yeah, no, I, it makes. I mean, you can see patterns like that. I completely get it. Um, that that's great. But uh, this is a mean field, you know, thing. Yeah. So. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, that's that's a, that's a really good question, Martin. It's uh, so trying to look for models of um, the unihemispheric slow wave sleep patterns. It's sort of a jumble at the moment. Um, there is no sort of, there hasn't been really any kind of convergence in terms of the modeling uh, for this phenomenon. Um, so Peter Robinson's group, for instance, has this really large complicated network model. Um, there's a bit of discrete dynamics thrown in there as well. Um, so I kind of stayed away from that. Um, other groups take very simplistic views and they use things like uh, essentially Fitzhugh and Nagumo and then they just add one or two terms to represent like diurnal cycles and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so at this stage, it might be a bit earlier to say, uh, it might be hard to find models that naturally have these things cropping up. Um, so I'm hoping that more models will be developed for these unihemispheric slow wave sleep patterns and uh, my so like so EEG neural field models are not not really ready for I don't, for I don't think so yeah mm -hmm. but this would be different right I mean here you have like the spatial heterogeneity built in so that's that's not yeah. kind of the symmetry breaking that that you observe in these chimeras right this is this is kind of you 
you got the left and you got the right, and then you see two different things. Isn't that isn't that different? I mean, for the for the models that I've seen so far, they um they are taking uh, identical um, mm -hmm. compartments and coupling them with uh, spatial spatially homogeneous parameters and connections. And so the only thing the spatial homogeneity comes from just the initial data that they use, as from what I remember. Mm, okay. Yeah, I mean, I can't see a priori why it would make a difference between left and right in the model. Right. You know? So you shouldn't you shouldn't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, because okay. from the modeling point of view, it's just identical cells in the left and right hemispheres. And locally coupling also makes sense because yeah. it's only talking in the middle. Right. Each other. Right. Yeah, well, and sort is also thought, I mean, it's, uh, what about sort of horses and cows, right? So animals that actually sleep while standing, yeah, and always ready to run away. Yeah, so uh, flamingos also, um, or at least flamingos like put up one leg when they sleep, and so they've got the unihemisphere slow wave sleep. Uh, I wasn't worried about the horses and cows, though. So that might be another application to look at. And so would you then also be interested in what happens to the system? I mean, this is sort of the sleep state, but what happens when now something happens that excites it and makes the animal wake up? And how does this sort of ripple through? Yeah, so there's this interesting question with the, the unihemispheric slow wave sleep in that um, when one hemisphere is asleep and the other hemisphere is awake, it doesn't stay like that. It switches periodically. Mm -hmm. um, between the two sides. And then I haven't actually looked at what happens when both sides are awake and what happens in that transition. But there has been a fair amount of research in terms of the periodic switching of the two hemispheres. Um, and do you actually know, so to which sleep rhythm does that uh, get closest to, to us like in that context? I mean, what's the free? There's a, a substantial frequency difference between these mm -hmm. two things. Yeah, that's the main thing they usually measure. They don't care yeah. about amplitude, I think. So, right. so, uh, so yeah, one, is, what, sure. one is in the beta range, the other one is in the gamma range or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure what it is for the bottlenose dolphins. I didn't see any reports of that. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for a great talk, Theo. That was Thanks wonderful. For yeah, and we look forward to another talk and visit by you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone.